Well, good morning. It's, um, it's really great to be here this morning and um, fantastic to, uh, to spend some time with you guys worshipping God. God longs for reconciliation. As I was looking at this uh, reading of um, Joseph being reconciled to his brothers, uh, there was a number of things that, uh, a number of directions you could pick up. Uh, but just to backtrack a little bit, where we left things off, you remember Joseph was sold into slavery just as a young boy. He grows up and you probably remember uh, from your Sunday school days uh, the stories about how Joseph was um, you know, put in charge of one of the, uh, the, the captain of the guard's house and that all went really well and the captain of the guard um, was incredibly blessed because of everything that Joseph did uh, was blessed by God. So, you know, things were going great um, but uh, he was such a charismatic and amazing person that uh, uh, Potiphar's uh, wife decided that uh, she wanted uh, to get in on some of uh, Joseph's blessing as well, and Joseph said, oh, that's, we're not going there. Um, and um, so she, uh, she accused him of doing something uh, inappropriate, and so Joseph got thrown into jail, even though he hadn't done anything. Um, and while he's in jail, uh, you remember there's the, um, uh, the, the king's cook and the king's cupbearer, the bread maker and the cupbearer. Um, and um, they're thrown into jail for upsetting the king. And they're there with Joseph and they both have these dreams about uh, what's going to happen, this uh, famine in the land and different things that's going to... Uh, going to happen and um, uh, and they have their, their dreams and they wake up and say oh you know they've had this terrible dream Joseph interprets them for uh, each of them and exactly as Joseph interprets comes true now the I think it's the um, the bread maker uh, gets uh, a very messy end uh, the cupbearer however um, everything goes well for him and um, but he forgets all about Joseph. You know, he's so excited about being freed and restored uh, that he forgets to mention uh, that Joseph's in prison uh, for two years until the king has these dreams um, about uh, the seven uh, fat cows that walk up out of the, uh, the river and then seven skinny, ugly cows walk up and, and they eat the, the fat cows. And, um, and the same with uh, stalks of wheat and seven... Uh, seven fat heads of grain and seven skinny heads of grain that consume the, the others. And, um, and he can't find anyone to help him interpret these dreams. Uh, and then the cupbearer remembers Joseph's in jail. And he says, oh, that's right. Um, there's this guy who can interpret dreams. And he did for me and it was exactly spot on. Um, and so Pharaoh sends for Joseph, brings him out of jail and says... You know, can you interpret these dreams? And he does. Um, and it's about uh, what's going to happen in the land and that there'd be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And uh, <coughs> Pharaoh instantly takes a liking to Joseph and says, right, well, I will put you in charge uh, of all the grain stores. And uh, through those seven years um, of plenty, Joseph rises to... You know, um, amazing authority, and and as we discover, it's sort of into the two years of the famine that the brothers come down to buy grain, and Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them as the brothers who banded together and sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him, but instead they they sold him into slavery, and now he sits on all of Pharaoh's wealth and uh, all of this amassed goodness and blessing. And there's a little bit of back and forth as he tries to keep it secret, doesn't want to tell them who he is, but basically he tries to get all the family down to Egypt uh, so he could get them all together, get his father there and reveal you know, who he is. 
and uh, doesn't quite work out the way he wants. Uh, they're a bit hesitant, they're quite reluctant, but in the end, uh, as we, this, this part that we pick up, he confesses to them, he reveals himself to them and says, you know, I'm your brother Joseph, the one that you, say, you sold into slavery years and years ago that you thought was dead and gone and, you know, uh, lost. And uh, we, we get something of their fear and trepidation as they realise that the person that they tried to kill uh, is now the head of this, you know, huge nation. Um, but what we see is an image of grace, an image of reconciliation. Joseph's longing to be back with his family and be reconciled to his brothers far outweighs any uh, bitterness over being sold, any bitterness about time in jail, anything like that, which, you know, face it, we would be uh, understanding if he was upset and blaming them for, you know, all of these bad things that happened to me, it's your fault. But rather he sees God at work, behind and in all of these things. Even in the midst of those difficult times, we see someone who, who had confidence that God was in all of this and going to use all of this. And there is this wonderful line where Joseph says to his brothers, that which you intended for harm, God turned into good, into blessing. It's not that God uh, made me go through harm first so that I could learn this lesson. No, God didn't make the harm. But he says, that which you intended for harm, God converted into something good. It's the other side of the harm that, you know, God was able to use that for positive things. And it's only the positive person who's able to, to see that and, and understand that. The hopeful person who hasn't let go of God, who can see those, those things taking place. It's a wonderful story of reconciliation. And, and I'd love to say, go out and do the same. Um, for, for everything that goes wrong in life, go out and be reconciled to all the people who hurt you. Um, I guess our stories, our lives, are not always so neat and so perfect and so uh, wonderfully dominated by love. So um, I have another story for you. I'm going to invite Barry and Prue to come and um, uh, read this story um, for us. But uh, just by way of narrating, this this is an old story, it's not mine, it comes out of the, recon the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa. Um, now often you could say that I've swapped names and places and made things, you know, taken stories that I know are from America and say that they happen just down the road here in Australia. Um, this is not one of those times. Uh, this actually comes from South Africa. I haven't targeted it uh, at anyone sitting in the second row at all. Um, <laughs> but um, this story emerged and was told and retold as a parable about the tension between truth and reconciliation. And the phrase, what about the bike, became shorthand for issues of truth in the process for seeking reconciliation. James, a 14-year-old newsboy, has saved his earnings for three years to finally buy the new bike of his dreams. Two days later, he is accosted in an alley by Eric, the white neighbourhood bully whose father is a capo for the local mob, whose uncle is the corrupt chief of police. Eric pushes James from the bike with a give it up, kid, and rides off. Powerless to do anything about the theft, James often sees Eric riding his beautiful new bike while he returns to his rusty old junker. Three years later, Eric, having gone through his own series of tough experiences, approaches James and says, uh, Kid, can we talk? I don't think so. Come on, chill out. I don't want to talk to you. Just listen to me for a minute. No way. 
You don't have anything to say that I would want to hear. Yes, I do. There is something I've got to say to you, okay? I can't imagine what. Hear me out. Okay. Look, um, uh, I know I was mean to you. I, I think about it when I see you. I don't know quite how to put it. It's just that, well, I wanted to say I'm sorry. I apologise. You? You're apologising to me? Yeah. What's this all about? Well, this may sound weird, but since my dad got killed, my whole life has been turned upside down. And I've been trying to, trying to sort things out. Well, actually, I've been going to church again. And, uh, well, I'm trying to make things right with people I hurt. So if I, I hurt you in any way, if I hurt you in any way, I want to ask your forgiveness. If you hurt me in any way, you say. Yeah, yeah. Will you, will you forgive me? Forgive you? You're asking me to forgive you? Yes. That sounds nice and all that. I mean, it may be good for you, but I have a question to ask you before we talk about all this forgiveness. Yeah? What about the bike? The bike? This isn't about the bike. It's about you and me. I don't have the bike anymore. It's long gone. Bikes. And they come and they go. This is about you and me. It's about us, you know. About relationship. And relationships? What relationship? That's why I've come to ask. I've, I've come to ask, will you forgive me? You think that that is all there is to it? You just say, I'm sorry? And say some nice stuff to make everything seem okay again? And then we forget about the past? And act like nothing happened? Well, yes. I have just one thing to say. Yes? What about the bike? <laughs> Reconciliation. What about the bike? It pushes us to think about reconciliation and forgiveness. Now that little story, that little drama enacted for us. I want you to just sit and think for a moment. What should it like? What should it look like? Sorry, for uh, for young James and Eric. What should go on. Just take a moment to think about the ideal <coughs> scenario from there, going forward. What the, the bully, uh, James, uh, no, the bully is Eric, uh, and James, uh, the victim, what should happen? It's a nice, simple story. If we could answer the simple one, maybe we could apply it to the more complex things that go on in our life. Maybe turn to uh, just the person next to you and um, share your thoughts quickly on what reconciliation, genuine reconciliation, would have to involve or what it would look like for those two boys. Just one minute.
And I might give you another question in a second. You seem to uh, be enjoying yourselves there. Uh, I'm sure all of you said, oh, well, he should replace the bike. No? Yeah. Uh, what sort of things did you come up with? <laughs> hey, hang on, just one at a time, one at a time. Penny? <laughs> Yeah, just an acknowledgement. Is that enough for for real reconciliation? What do you bit, think? Bit more emotion. Oh, sorry. A bit more emotion from the one that. Okay. Uh, took quite yeah, It didn't seem like he was sorry. Okay, there's something missing there. Yeah. Yeah, Jodie. Yeah, I think you've taken ownership of the not only that you've taken the fight, but what that meant to the other person. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's an exactly. understanding. Yeah. Uh, not just, oh, I stole your bike and I'm sorry, but an understanding of the impact of what that actually meant. Yeah. Show me the money. Sorry, show me the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. The, um, the person who's the bully needs to ask, what do you need from me? What to make? Such a good mediator. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts? I, well, I sat down and thought about it for a bit, and I've, I've used this uh, skit before, and I really love the story. It is genuinely, I find it genuinely helpful. Um, real restoration does somehow need to account for the loss of this boy's bike. Uh, physically this, he's lost something and you could say yes just acknowledge it uh, but the ideal scenario would, that, would be that that was somehow uh, replaced or covered maybe with money maybe it's a new bike but maybe that time has passed maybe he's not maybe he doesn't deliver anymore and doesn't need a bike um, so sometimes that opportunity goes and you have to get quite creative to work out what would be an appropriate restoration of the item that was stolen. That's, that's a part of it. It's not all of it. There does need to be a demonstration of real understanding of the impact of what the bike represented. Because the bike is not just a means of getting around. He, he had another bike, didn't he? So it's not just that he needed to get around, it's the acknowledgement of you worked for three years for that new one. Three years of work has now been stolen. Three years of dreams and hopes and excitement and expectation has now been stolen, hasn't it? And there's a loss attached to that, that if that doesn't get acknowledged, it's somehow not enough, is it? So understanding the impact of what the actions meant to the victim is a really big part of reconciliation. The other thing I hope you guys might have talked about is a demonstration of change in behaviour. Or did we all just sort of assume that? I wonder. The, the bully needs to demonstrate that he's actually changed, doesn't he? Because if he was to buy him a new bike and say, oh, I'm really sorry, uh, and he's, he's extra for all the, all the stuff, you know, all the work that you put in to buy this bike, uh, now we even. Would that make him even if a week's later he stole it again? or he pushed him over, or kicked him out, or if he hurt him again, would, would you be saying they're reconciled? Well, he, he replaced the bike. He replaced the, the, the income, the loss of the dreams and the hopes. Change. No. Change has to happen, doesn't it? We want to see a change in behaviour. If somebody comes and says, I'm sorry for hurting you, that's nice. That's but that's only words. For reconciliation, you know, we're not just going on saying sorry. If we're genuinely chasing that deeper level of 
reconciliation, that, that you and I are truly reconciled to one another, then a change in behaviour needs to follow that I'm sorry and the acknowledgement and the, the understanding of you know, maybe what my actions did to you to hurt you or to offend you. If I say sorry, that's nice. But if I can say I understand how it hurt you and why that was hurting to you, you feel better. But if you see that that understanding has changed the way I live, and that I don't say those things or I don't do those things anymore, if I'm mindful in my actions to, to acknowledge, you know, that there's got to be a different way of doing things, then you would see my life has changed, wouldn't you? Or this, this boy, uh, James. You would see the change. And reconciliation might then then be a process that could be taken. Prior to the change in behaviour, is reconciliation really possible? Prior to the acknowledgement and the understanding, is true forgiveness even possible? If the other person doesn't even know what they've done, and they say, sorry, uh, I want you to forgive me, if I've hurt you in any way, but with no, with no understanding of what they've done wrong, is forgiveness really possible between the two parties? I'll give you just a couple of seconds. How are we going for time? A couple of seconds. I want you to think about this for a moment. Should, in a situation like this, should the boy even be asking the other to, for, to forgive them. You know, we, we often talk about forgiveness quite glibly, quite lightly. Should he even go and ask for forgiveness? Would it not be more appropriate to ask for mercy, to ask for another chance, with the hope that if you gave me another chance, then I could prove to you that I've changed. Don't, you don't need to forgive me now, but if you just give me mercy enough to give me another chance, I could demonstrate that I do understand. I could show you that I'm a changed person and that, that I'm genuinely upset that what I did hurt you. And then if I show you, because you gave me mercy, that I am a changed person, do I even need to ask for forgiveness? Because isn't that your blessing to me, not my right? If I've made you the victim, isn't it something that you give freely because you believe I've changed? rather than something I should ask for, like, I said I'm sorry, so therefore, you, you know, I've earned forgiveness. Interesting, isn't it? We talk about forgiveness like it's such a simple thing. And even in such a simple scenario, we realise there's a lot more to it. There's a lot going on in that process of truth and reconciliation and of forgiveness if we're talking about real forgiveness. What about the bike? It's a really valuable question for me in my life when I'm the victim because it reminds me that forgiveness is not about being a doormat. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere does God call me to just forgive people who hurt me willy-nilly and to forgive everybody who hurts me and allow them to just keep doing it. Nowhere does God want that kind of reconciliation that means I'm a doormat, that my feelings, that my hurts don't mean anything, that they're not important. 
Because forgiveness and reconciliation is not that. God does not call you to be a doormat when people hurt you. God does not say reconciliation means taking the things that were really important to you, that were really significant in your life, and if someone steals them or breaks them or disrespects them, that you should just pretend they mean nothing and put them to one side. God is not saying that. That reconciliation is more important than you. That's not good news for anybody. Reconciliation, for me, when I'm the victim, requires genuine understanding with the other person. That they need to understand what and why something hurt. But as I said, it's not always possible. The person may not always have the capacity for that kind of understanding. The person who hurt me may have no capacity to even understand feelings. So, you know, am I to sit there waiting and waiting and waiting in hope that they might one day wake up to themselves and come and talk to me about reconciliation? It may not be possible. But if they are to change, if I believe that people can change, then the door needs to be open, doesn't it? From my side. If I'm the victim, I need to keep a door open that one day they might change, that one day their actions might show that they understand and that they've learned and that they've changed their ways of being. Maybe I could trust them again. Maybe I could be vulnerable to them again. But only if that door remains open. If I close the door, if I burn that bridge and say I'm never going to have anything to do with that person ever again because they hurt me that one time, how will I ever know if their side of reconciliation is happening? If God has done something miraculous in their life, I won't know it if my eyes are closed. So the story is good news for me if I'm a victim. It's also really valuable and good news for me if I'm the one hurting someone else. If I do damage to people in life, which I'm sad to say I do, and you know you're the same. We hurt people without even trying. Sometimes we don't even know it, but we do nonetheless hurt people with our words or with our actions and uh, just as Jody was saying in, in uh, Linda's introduction sometimes our words can be like a tube of toothpaste that you squeeze out and out and out and out and out till the whole thing's empty and on the plate and then you think oh goodness that's too much how do I get it back in the tube sometimes in our life we get ourselves covered in toothpaste, don't we? But when we become aware of it, when somebody helps us see we've gone overboard here, our words have done damage, when we see it, then we can begin to act on it. And that's when this phrase, what about the bike, helps me to think at that deeper level. It helps me to think, what has gone on for the other person, for the victim, for the, the wounded person that I've hurt? What is important for them? Of course, forgiveness is important for me. Reconciliation might be important for me because that's my issue. But what is it that went on for them that I need to understand before I get my need for forgiveness sorted? Theirs comes first. Sometimes uh, I only know that I've hurt somebody through certain consequences. And I only learn because I start to realise people don't talk to me, people don't ring me, people don't ask me for you know, advice. or Things happen. Those are the consequences of hurting people. There are big ones. But if I'm aware of it, I can change my actions. I can change my thinking. Sometimes it's the thinking that has to change first and then we start to act differently. 
and I can really endeavour to understand the damage that I might have caused, which I find always requires me to be a little bit vulnerable. If, if I've hurt somebody, uh, for me to really understand often requires me to say, I think I did something wrong. I can tell there's something in the relationship that's broken down. Please explain to me what I've done. You know, and it's like painting a big target on your chest and sitting back and saying, let me know all of the things that I said, that I did. And that's often not fun. If I really want reconciliation though, it requires me to be vulnerable. True reconciliation is going to cost me something. But I know, and I'm promising all of you, that you will end up richer for the process. It will cost you, but you'll get back more than you are charged. I believe truly that God loves reconciliation. God is all about reconciliation and he loves us to be reconciled to one another. And more than that, he loves it when we long for that reconciliation with him. And we go through that same process with God. I believe something wonderful happens when we enter into this process, when we seek this kind of process in our human relationships, but also with God. We receive those blessings. We receive those divine miracles. Enemies become friends again. Enemies become loved. And wouldn't that be a blessing if all of our enemies in this world became loved. Wouldn't that be just somehow like we were Joseph and everything we touched turned to gold if we knew about reconciliation. Loving Lord God, we ask that you would continue to teach us about grace and mercy and reconciliation and forgiveness. And that as we work these things out with you, that your spirit would open our eyes and our hearts and our minds. And even as we make ourselves vulnerable in the process, that somewhere in the midst of it, we would notice that we gain love, that we gain loved ones back to us friends, family members, neighbours, those who are completely different and other from us, that we would begin to gain them as beloved friends. Lord God, may this be your blessing to us in the coming days. Amen. We're going to finish with our final song. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Oh, and we're going to take up the offering just as we're doing that.
that. We don't need to do that. Yeah, I reckon it might end up being eight, which is kind of a lot. Oh, that's right. We've got Andy and um, uh, and David. Oh, so, yeah, come in as well. But yeah, so it's people like Emma, Justin, uh, Rian, uh, Ruan, uh, all those kind of guys that have a very good phone. And yeah, it's fun. So yeah, obviously, we get things quite fresh. Yeah, I mean, if you get up to 10, it's probably good. Thanks.